Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I will be your host today. Um, I need to apologize. We're having all kinds of gremlins today. Um, Allie is here, but she's going to be on her phone because we don't have audio. And I'm not sure why we didn't have music to start, <laughs> but we're going to get there one way or the other. So thank you for being so patient and we'll go. All right. Um, I want to thank our sponsors today. Uh, it's the Weaving Guild of St. Louis, and they're doing this in memory of Dorothy Haddock. I think that's just a wonderful way of saying thank you and recognizing someone who was important to you and your guild. Uh, so way to go, Weavers Guild of St. Louis. And welcome, Dorothy. I know you're smiling down on us and, and excited to be part of Textiles and Tea today. Thank you, Weavers Guild of St. Louis. As always, we'll take questions. They'll be the last 15 minutes of the hour. Please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Love your comments in the chat. Keep those going. But I don't see the questions in chat very well. I, I see them better in the Q&A. Um, today, we have Allie Dudley. <laughs> Allie um, is a textile artist working within the multiple traditions of Appalachian hand weaving styles. Um, Allie specializes in tapestry and historical overshot. And as a resident artist in weaving at the John C. Campbell Folk School in Brasstown, North Carolina, Allie manages the Folk School's weaving studio and assists with teaching classes in both tapestry and needlework. Allie's work appeared in the 2021 exhibit, uh, Pulling the Thread, a brief survey of Appalachian textiles, and that was at Rabin Gap. Nakuchi School in Clayton, Georgia, it's North Georgia. In short, Allie says, the history of weaving is the history of humanity as well as its future. Losing the knowledge of hand weaving could mean losing a part of our human selves. Hey, Allie. Hey, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Thank you so much for hanging there with us. I'm glad we got this uh, worked out. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Good to, good to be here on the phone with you, Kathy. <laughs> um, first, let's start with the important question, which is what is your favorite tea? Um, I When I go for tea, I usually go for like a peppermint or like an herbal tea, but um, right now I just have leftover coffee from this morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we talk some, share with us how you got started in fiber? Because you have kind of a securitous route there. Um, yeah, so I um, learned how to knit when I was a kid, as a lot of kids do, and I was like, it's just a knitter for a really long time, and um, when I was in college, I had a friend who went to Warren Wilson, and they have a weaving uh, program there as part of their, like, work, learn, volunteer situation, and she had me come by the studio, and she made me thread a straight draw on her loom because she didn't want to do it, and I was like, whoa, this, this is actually really fun, and I love it. Um, and, uh, there's somebody actually who is weaving a blooming leaf overshot coverlet on like a different loom. And I saw it and I was like, that's what I need to do with the rest of my life now. So when I went back to college, um, I was like, not in, a, like art school or anything, but I just like, I was in, in school in Chicago. So I just Googled weaving Chicago and then, um, the Chicago weaving school popped up and that's really where I learned how to weave. Um, and I, uh, wove a lot with them my last year of college and then I moved down to Asheville and just have been around craft schools ever since then. Lucky for us, lucky for us. <laughs> so like you said, you started out in like cinema and media studies, correct? So yes. how, how, did, how did those studies impact on the work that you do now, do you think, or did it at all? Yeah, I think that um, it did because I, when I look back at the work that I was doing in in film, a lot of what I was really interested in was not like, you know, making like feature movies. I was really interested in like experimental cinema mm -hmm. and uh, working with like analog film. So my senior thesis film that I made, I actually like did it on 16 millimeter, um, which was really cool and fun. And there was like something just about the like tactile nature of that that really spoke to me. And I also uh, really enjoyed the editing process. So, um, just 
just taking like uh, footage and assembling it and putting it together. And I even then was like, before I got into like the craft world, was really striving to create like well-crafted work. Um, So I think that like, I was definitely like looking for the same kinds of things in my film as I do now in my, in my weaving and textile work. Uh, That's great. We're going to talk more about that as we go on today. Um, One of the, uh, one of your works um, is that you use in this, this one uses overshot. It's a a lovely um, wall hanging and you like overshot. You're really drawn to that in the coverlets. What do you think is the attraction for you for this particular weave? Um, I like, I don't know. It's hard to explain why I love it so much. I think that the first time I ever saw it, I was just like, oh my God, like that looks wild. And I can't believe that it's like the kind of weave that people were making in, you know, the 1800s. It just like totally blew my mind because it just looks so like fresh and modern. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's, I, I like, I like tapestry and I like weaving on a floor loom. And I like that they do like different things for my brain. And I really enjoy just being able to make in this instance with Overshot, just like intricate designs, but like really fast. So I think that appeals to me too. And there's just, it just looks so cool like how, I don't know how you could like look at an overshot cover and not be like totally enraptured and you know I love that um now this next coverlet I fell in love with when I saw it for, that you did um when I saw it I thought this is such a wonderful combination of old and new because it is the old structure of overshot but you put a really nice twist on it with the color off to the side. And then there's that little square down in the bottom right corner. Uh, I just thought it was a wonderful combination of, of both. So would you would you talk some about this piece? Yeah, so this piece, I wove this in 2019 in winter residency at Penland School of Craft um, down in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. Um, I went into the two weeks. I actually wove that other piece that you just showed in the first week of that residency. And then I wove this in the second week. Um, And it was sort of like my first go at like combining like tapestry and overshot or, you know, combining the things I like about weaving on a floor loom and the things I like about tapestry. Um, And so uh, when I was at Penland the first time in 2017, taking a class from Tommy Scanlon. Hi, Tommy. And uh, Bakhti Zeke. I learned, um, I went in like thinking, I don't not, I don't really care about tapestry. Like this will be kind of cool to learn how to do. But like, I really was excited about like learning about really complicated drafts and stuff like that. And then I just ended up totally falling in love with tapestry. Um, and yeah, so this is me trying to like take those two parts of my brain and like put them together a little bit. So my original plan for this coverlet was to just weave like a bedside coverlet in all black, keep it simple, but then put like a little tiny tapestry down in the corner and just see if it could like structurally combine the two. Um, and so I did that first panel on the right. I wove that one first, did my little um, inlay and I was like, okay, cool, great. Like check, check that off. Um, and then when I was coming towards the last panel, I actually ran out of black yarn um, because I did not plan ahead. And I just was like, they don't have enough in the closet at Penland. I definitely don't need to buy any, even though I'm leaving a whole blanket. Um, and so I ended up just like pulling a bunch of random colors and using what I could. And I really like a gradient. So it worked out. And I think that um, I this is like a blanket that I sleep with on my bed like every day. So it's really special to me. It's my first coverlet. So it just is like a really, I think, formative um, piece for me in terms of like what I, what I want to be making. It was kind of like the first like jump towards that for me. I love it because when I saw it, I was like, that's a brilliant idea. I wish I thought of that. And so when they, you <laughs> told me the story, I thought you never know. You just, you never know when, when inspiration will will rear its head I think that's a great problem yeah and great problem it worked out so much better than if I just had an all black cover yeah know? yeah yeah I love that um now you also do tapestry as you talked about and um in this next piece again the one thing I like about doing this show is I get to show the works I like so the next piece I love this piece mainly because of 
I, especially with that piece in the middle, there's just a lovely flow to this piece, not just the red piece, but there's flow throughout it. I just love this. And then your strong contrast of, of color and positive negative space, and then the balance of the light and dark. I love this piece. So can you talk some about not just the visual, but maybe the, the meaning behind it also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this one I wove, um, I wove it in my little shack that I was living in Brasstown last year. Like my house is really tiny and I didn't have room to set up my floor loom. And um, uh, I just saw something come in the chat about how big this is. I think this piece is like eight inches by six inches. So it's not very big. Um, and I was just feeling really like creatively kind of stifled, like a little bit overwhelmed with like my new job and like I didn't know what to do. So it's like, I just literally had to put something on a loom and weave it. Um, and so I did, and I wove this, um, and the way I like usually approach my tapestry design, um, and this is a trick I got from Tommy as I, you know, where I've gotten all of my tapestry tricks. Um, but I'm not really great at drawing. I don't enjoy it. I don't really feel like it's something that's ever been like super productive for me in terms of like coming up with design, but I really enjoy collaging um mm -hmm. and like paper weaving so I've done a, a couple of tapestries where I like took uh pictures that I'd taken cut them up and then you know collage them together so this one the design is from a photo that I took of um, my brother and then one of my friends um we were going on like a walk or something in Philly and then another photo I had taken of a mountains in Colorado and then a piece of painted paper that I had left over from um, yet again, a workshop with Tommy. Um, and so I just like took those, cut them up and then um, kind of moved them around until I came up with this. Uh, the paper was like not quite that vibrant, but that was the color of red yarn I have. I feel like I always end up weaving like black and white and red <laughs> colors. So, um, and I feel like when I first started, I was, I just was interested mostly in like doing like color blending and like trying to get the feel of like reeds against the background of, a wa of the water, but I didn't want it to be all uh, black and white. So I, I wove a bunch of red and then at the end of it, I was like, oh, this is actually like super creepy looking and like feels a little bit <laughs> like, I, it, it, it felt happier when I was leaving it. Then I was like, oh, that's a little bit like, um, I don't know, Ooh, kind of scary. <laughs> Well, how do you design as you, do you kind of change your design as you're going? Do you have it all planned out before you start? The way I weave tapestry, I've like gone back and forth between those two. And I feel like it's most productive for me when I like have a cartoon. Um, so like when I had that design, I had my little paper like printed out and then I don't, I don't need to show you with both my hands. I was about to like <laughs> try to talk on the phone and like gesture with my hands at the same time. But uh <laughs> So I had my paper and then um, I took like a clear sheet of plastic and then traced over it with a Sharpie, just like the okay. outlines of like where the color changes happen. Um, so it, like, it's hard to tell, like just looking at the cartoon, what the actual picture is going to be at the end, because the important part isn't necessarily like the shade, but it's like where the color changes. Um, so I have that uh, that's like sitting behind the warp as I go and then I weave up and follow that. Um, and yeah, so I, I usually like when I when I'm weaving a tapestry and I have a thought in my in my head of what I want the design to be, I usually plan it out pretty well ahead of time. Well, this piece that we're showing right now is another one. Like I said, I get to choose what we're going to show, and I love this one because um, it it looks like you drew it out and you shaded it in, you know, with the lovely darkness behind that purple. It just gives a wonderful depth. I mean, it's it's a great drawing if it wasn't a tapestry. Um, and I'm showing that just because I, I love this work. I love how you uh, play with color and uh, light and dark again, as we talked about. So let me ask you about tapestry and uh overshot i mean a while ago you said to that they were similar for you but they're so different in how you weave them i mean one's on a loom one's on a frame loom um so when you're trying to decide what you're going to make um does it do you say okay i want to do something on the um floor loom 
and then you decide what you're going to make? Or do you come up with a design first and then you decide tapestry loom, floor loom, or a combination? I feel like I, <laughs> I, I usually like am like, I really want to weave on my floor loom. So like, let me come up like I, with something to do with that. Or I don't know. I feel like kind of like they're the same thing, you know, like things that I weave on my tapestry loom, I, I wouldn't like they just live in a different part of my brain than the floor loom so it's like when I'm like I want to weave tapestry it's like because like I have this thought and I need to get it out um but I've sometimes I feel like I, I like I just am warping up something for my floor loom for the first time in like months and months and months and I like feel a little bit guilty about like not weaving all the time but it's like I am trying to let go of the feeling of guilt of like not always doing things because I have other things that I'm like really interested in doing as well like right now I just really am loving reading books so it's like yes I could be leaving right now but I also this is good for my brain in a different way and like fueling me creatively so I think that I'm trying to be less hard on myself about (laughs) not having ideas all the time and just you know creating in the way that I want to be creating it's so funny because I'm sure people listening are saying the same thing that um, I'm always amazed when I hear people say, oh, I feel so guilty that I'm not weaving. It's like, wait, I thought weaving was supposed to be the good part of your life. How can it make you feel guilty? So it's good to hear someone whose life is about fiber is struggling with that also. Not that I'm glad you're struggling, but I don't feel so <laughs> yeah. alone in my guilt. Yeah, I mean, I do because, you know, as you do too, like a lot of facilitating of other people creating is like also, you know, it takes a lot of energy. So I'm, I have, I do a lot of that. Like I do 40 hours of that every week. And sometimes it's hard to, you know, have the brain space to do my own thing, but that's just where I am in my life right now. So. Well, is it hard to switch from work weaving to personal weaving? I mean, from teaching a fiber class to shift gears into what you want to do? Um, not really yet. I haven't, so I'm teaching my first week long tapestry class in like a week and a half. Yay. (laughs) So (laughs) I've taught a couple other like weekend classes. So I haven't really like had the same, like spending all my time, like working on like writing up this tapestry booklet as I, you know, am right now. So it's a little bit new for me. Um, but it just sort of feels like, you know, another like driving force behind like what I'm doing. So it's like, I need to be like weaving tapestry this week because like I have a thing coming up and like, it is, that's just what I need to be doing. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I don't do a ton of like weaving while I'm at work. Also, it's just, it's a little bit more studio operations, but um, you know, the kind of weaving culture or I guess like craft, like, you know, class schedule and the kind of like craft community that I am like hoping to help foster here at the folk school is, you know, the kind of work that I want to be doing. Um, So I I guess that I get to sort of like cultivate that in my work life. Um, And, you know, just, just by virtue of like the things that I am interested in and like the kind of teachers that I want to be hanging out with and like people that I want to be meeting. So so yes but like kind of in an oblique way I like that that's good um we've got some of your um stitching work too because you talk some about tapestry and your overshop but you do some beautiful stitching work too so here's a couple of uh, images of the work that you do um how and your stitching it looks like you do much more um personal themes um, that you, you can say more, well, maybe that's not true. You do personal things with your stitching work. So how do you choose the things that, that you do, that you focus on? Mm-hmm. I feel like with stitching, it's definitely easier to just put words in there. Like it, I have a lot easier time stitching words than I do weaving words. Um, and I know some people are really good at weaving words. Like I'm not that great at it. So I think that's just like one area where I let the medium sort of dictate what I what I do you know um but in my other life uh I also do design cross stitch designs and I and I um take antique cross stitch charts and then like chart them into publishing software and like do all that so 
I have a lot of just other work experience working with cross stitch specifically and like a little bit of other kinds of needlework. Um, so I think a lot of that, when I just am like looking at samplers, it makes me excited about stitching. So like I, I was doing a lot more of this kind of thing when I was doing that job full time. Um, but that piece on the left, uh, a friend asked me to make a design and it's just like really easy to go in the little cross stitch program and like click around and like draw stuff with pixels. It's like pretty fun. Um, but then you have to stitch it and that takes a lot longer. So, um, it's, it feels a little bit like, um, you know, a little bit of like faster, like satisfying process, but in the end it actually isn't because <laughs> you have to stitch the whole thing. But, um, I, I think that like the things that I like doing with stitching and with weaving kind of are in a similar zone though, because I like taking historical processes and like ways of making, but then like, you know, doing new things with them in terms of like, you know, kids would stitch historical samplers and they would put like, you know, spooky verses about like death and dying at a young age or like the Lord's Prayer on them. But I'm like, mm, if like I were, you know, a nine year old, like right now stitching a sampler, like what would I put on it? So I was like, I, I stitched another sampler where I took like a meme and like, wrote the whole thing out in cross stitch and it took me like two years and I was like wow this is was it worth two years on this joke oh and it actually was pretty funny but I haven't gotten it framed yet so I can't even like hang it on my wall and laugh at it but um just stuff like that like you know doing things because people back then would like stitch things on their pieces that they thought were important or like wanted to read every day so I'm like I I should do that too and like make it funny and enjoyable so how'd you get started with cross uh, doing cross stitch or stitchery in general? Um, that was another thing where I just like just picked it up one day. I think I, I feel like I started doing that maybe around the time when I got serious about knitting because I had been knitting like scarves for years and years and years and years. And then one day in college, I was like, I'm going to knit a sock and I knit a sock and I was like, I should buy this cross stitch kit on Etsy. And I did. And I really liked it. Um, and that was that <laughs> and then when i moved to Asheville, like um one of my friends told me about a cross stitch um a needlework supply store um called sassy jack stitchery that is out in weaverville and i went there and they're like oh do you actually want a job and so like somehow like i got a job like working in textiles which was really amazing just like you know by because somebody told me about this place so um, I feel lucky that like I've just kind of like stumbled <laughs> upon so many important things in my life that just like randomly happened. Um, but yeah, I, I I I was really grateful to be able to like handle you know antique textiles at work at such a young age. <laughs> well, um, are you still doing that? Are you still working with them? Yeah, yeah, I am. So I'm I'm working on. I don't have as much time anymore, but I still mm -hmm. do design stuff for them, and I also they'll do some antique charting and say the name again it's sassy what sassy jacks stitchery okay we'll yeah. give a shout out to them <laughs> everybody needs to know where all the good fiber stores are right yeah well i was um well you've studied with some incredible people um and you've mentioned uh tommy scanlon uh bhakti zeke uh, I was jealous with that one. Uh, Melissa Dunning Weaver, um, just all kinds of people. How? What do you think is the most important thing, or the biggest thing that you get from working with these people who have such uh, chops in the fiber world? Um, I think well, one thing about all of them is that they are just so like eager and willing to share what they know with like me and with every student that they have. Um, like Tom especially really is like taking me under her wing and I just there's something like that is just really special to me about like being able to like learn from someone by like watching them. Um, I actually so I recently got a grant from South Arts as part of their Emerging Traditional Artists program where they gave us all like a ton of money for a learning experience and it's like a really cool cohort and program um and so i spent some of my money on going up to marshfield the school of weaving and taking a class up there um this past february and I, that was like really i feel like another pivotal point in my weaving journey 
um, I've been kind of looking for, you know, like going back further and further, like in weaving history. And now I'm at the point where I'm really interested in barn looms and like uh, weaving historical textiles aside from just coverlets. Um, so that's really what like got me going uh, at first. And um, Justin Swizero was teaching our class. Oh, and okay. there's like just a, a couple times where I would like watch him even just like thread the loom or like watch him warp and like something would click. And it's like, oh, like that's like what I have been trying to do for so long. It's just like that one thing you did with your hand. And it's, it, and he actually mentioned it and talked about it a little bit with like this experiential learning process where you don't learn from like reading books and you don't learn by yourself. You learn from watching someone who's been doing it for years and years and like learn from someone else who's been doing it for years and years. And just that whole like communal aspect of, um taking like or like learning knowledge and like learning from someone in a community who like eagerly wants to pass it on and just um yeah learning from watching them and just like watching their body was really like important for me and yeah I think just all of the teachers that I've had who've been like really special in my life just want to share so much and like care mm -hmm. so much about textiles and weaving um and just want to make sure that nobody like forgets about it so yeah. So is that what you studied up at, is it Marshfield that you went to? You studied historical weaving or? Yeah, so um, I just took their foundations class because I had never been before. And it's basically a week where they just like show you the ropes of barn looms. So like, even though I'm a oh, okay. you know, pretty experienced weaver, like I still took their beginning class because I have never woven on a barn loom before. Yeah. Um, and it's, so different it's so different from using like a jack loom and i am obsessed and now i'm like i only care about counterbalance looms i don't care if i never weave on a jack loom ever again i just that's all i want <laughs> uh you're going to become one of those the person to call when you find that that barn loom and you're not sure what to do with it you're going to end up with tons of them you can tell already well i already found one in the, in the folk school weaving studio and so i've got to put that together somewhere now oh but, yeah um, yeah. Oh, that's so, I, I that's don't great. have a spot for it yet. It's pretty big, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah, that's always the problem. Um, if, if, now, I know it's kind of silly talking about the younger you because you're so young compared to a lot of us. <laughs> but if you could go back to, you know, you getting ready to go to college, what would you say to you? What would you say, oh, don't do this or do that? Or would you just say, go for it? You know, you're on the right track, whatever. Um, I feel like I don't, ha I, I don't have a ton of regrets in my life. Oh, we lost you there for a second. Got it. Oh, there we go. Can you, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it went away there <laughs> okay. for a minute. No, you're good. I just, I feel like I don't have a lot of regrets in my life. And sometimes I'm like, maybe I should have like gone to weaving college or whatever but if I had you know I wouldn't have I feel like I would have like missed something like there uh -huh. are a lot of like points in my life where I like did something that I was like that was a really bad idea and I like I shouldn't have done that but then it like led me to this other thing and it, like led me to this other thing and now I'm here working at the folk school and it's like you know who knows if I would have gotten to brass sound eventually if I you know just gone right into weaving but um yeah, when I went to college, I really was like, film is my life and my passion, and it's what I want to do. And then I found out that there was something else that I actually cared about more, or, you know, not not even necessarily more, but just decided that it was more worth my time. And um, yeah, so I feel like I probably wouldn't, I would just, I would just tell my younger self, just, just do, just do what you think is best, <laughs> and things will probably be fine. <laughs> well, reading your your bio and your history, I was it was amazing how um, I, I had visions of I know this is bizarre. I had visions of Candyland, you know, where you go here and that makes you go up here, and then this happens and you go over here because there were some just kind of random acts that really changed your life. Like you're going to see your friend's loom and realizing that's what I want to do, and being in a class with Tommy Scanlon and how I'm sure that really changed the trajectory of your life after that. So it's amazing how how contacts with people have really changed your direction of your life as you go. Yeah, 
sometimes it's like honestly a little overwhelming to think about because that is definitely how I feel like looking back on my life you Uh know like I ended up in Asheville and then you know there's just yeah I have so many weavers and like other textile folks in my life that have done like so much for me creatively um you know I uh part of the um the you mentioned the Raven Gabnikuchi school show um that I had a piece in and I actually was asked to give a talk to them um in conjunction with that um Tommy also gave a talk which was really nice to hear um but uh a lot of what I talked about was community and I think that Hmm. community is just like so important and intrinsic to like weaving culture and just craft culture in general and you know all of the weavers that I've met I feel like have, have like taught me something or just like brought me in and yeah I don't know where I would be without <laughs> without all these other weavers in my life so definitely it, it feels a little bit sometimes in in my in my life you know you and I'm sure in everybody's life you're just like walking around and you're like well I guess I'll make this big life-changing decision and like move to Asheville or like move to Brasstown or whatever but then looking back it really does feel like a like connected path of like oh that I that was I was supposed to do that because now I ended up here doing this thing so yeah a lot to think about (laughs) (laughs) well what's going to be next for you do you think um okay I weirdly am obsessed with like willow baskets right now I was reading really? this before I got on the call I haven't actually made one yet but I've like I, I that's what I want to make next so um I'm not about to stop weaving coverlets but uh I want to try baskets too um and uh I'm teaching my tapestry class next week and I just worked up for some dish towels for a friend who's getting married so I'm just gonna keep on weaving and um working with the folk school and scheduling classes and saying hi to you if you come and take a class at the folk school so yeah oh and also i um on the barn looms topic i i have added learning woodworking to my list of list of things to learn so that i can learn how to build a barn loom one day but i feel like that's a little further down the pipeline for me well you're in the right place right Yes. I mean, yes, I am. there's somebody there that can teach you anything, right? Blacksmithing, yeah. classmaking, everything's at John Campbell, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what is it about teaching that you like so far? Um, I realized this after I taught our little middle kids camp this year. I really love teaching kids. Like I like adults, but I love teaching kids so much. They're just so fun and um they I feel like um not that all of the adults that I've taught have you know have not been this way necessarily, but kids just really will just like jump in and be like, Oh, you want me to try this like thing? Like, okay, great. And then they like don't care if it looks bad or you know, if they are just learning and they make mistakes and sometimes they cry, but they tell Aww. you why they're frustrated. And then we can work through the problems together. So I really like that they like talk to me about how they're feeling while they're, while I'm teaching them. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, And uh, I just love when like a kid gets really excited about something that I'm excited about. It like gives me a little like warm fuzzies. So just like the part of teaching that I really like is the playing. And I feel like it gives me a lot of energy when I like see what someone else is working on. It's like, oh, I never thought of that. And like, let me try it now too. Um, and that was something I really loved about Tommy um, and her teaching style is like, I've assisted a lot of her classes and often I would be like, well, what about this thing? And she would just say, you should just try it. And I would. And that like, you know, brought me a lot of like new discoveries in my tapestry weaving work. So, Yeah. Yeah, Tommy's on today, so. um. Yes, I see Tommy in the chat. (laughs) (laughs) You got a whole fan club in the chat today. That's wonderful. Yeah, hello, hello everyone who who (laughs) said hi to me. (laughs) I see you all. (laughs) It's such a small community and such a big community. Now, you were at Convergence, right? I was, yes, the first Convergence. Yeah, that's talking about a big community, small community. Uh, That was pretty amazing of getting to see people again and um yeah did you see it was fun 
Yeah, I was fun seeing a lot of people who I have, like, emailed, like, a lot of folk school instructors I'd never met before, or, like, people whose names I knew, and then finally being, like, they would be, like, oh, like, I'm so-and-so, and be, like, oh, like, I talked to you so much on the phone, <laughs> and now I know what you look like, so yeah, it, was, yeah. it was cool. It was great. It was good to have you there. All right, yeah. how about we answer some questions? Sure. All right, Carol Ventura. Hi, Carol. Uh, in regards to the problem of running out of black thread for your coverlet, remember there are no mistakes, only design opportunities. Boy, that's true, isn't it? That was that's good. Way to go, Carol. Um, oh, and Liz Adamson wants to know what was the size again on that um, fire or something? Yeah, I think it was like eight inches by six inches. It okay. was not very big. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know that's one of the questions is um, what size you work in. I think somebody was saying, what is the largest piece that you've woven in overshot and in tapestry? Um, and that's from Karen LeBlanc. Um, the largest overshot piece I did, I wove last summer. I had two friends who were getting married and I wove them a queen size coverlet. And that was like 110 inches by 120. It was it was pretty big. I had to fly it to Portland, Oregon, and it took up most of my luggage. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I haven't. And for tapestry, I have not woven a lot of very big pieces. The biggest one, let me see if I can remember. It's probably like eight by 12 uh -huh. or something like that. Just because I don't have a very big tapestry loom, um, and I haven't woven any like really tall pieces, so. Well, speaking of small tapestry, Rebecca Bezoff was on here too. Hi, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> um, and have you had a solo group um, exhibition? We talked about the one at um, uh, Raven Gap. What other exhibits are you are you looking toward? Are there some coming up? Um, there's. I have a piece in the show at the Oak Ridge Gallery in Knoxville. Oh, okay. Um, and I have, I guess, the last one I had something in was the Australian Tapestry Workshop, um, the small tapestry uh, exhibit they had there, the Irene Davies, um, that, that piece, um, the Lake of Fire one that we talked about was in that show last year. Um, I don't have How did that piece up, do in that show? Um, I mean, they accepted it into the show, which is like a big deal. <laughs> I didn't like win any anything, but you know, there was. A, <laughs> I thought you got an award an in part. that show. I thought you got an award. I, you get an award just for being in the show. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah, I was pretty yeah. impressed. Australia, way to go! I know it's kind of scary sending things there because it's like I, you know, I just have to hope and pray this will make it back to me one day. Uh -huh, that's true. You're true. Um. Let's see. Oh, this is from Kevin Roberts. I think you've got a kindred spirit here. You will love willow weaving and it's vert creative. I think that's very creative. I'm not sure what that meant. Um, also pine needle baskets and bark baskets are fun too. So Kevin is ready to move you into the whole world of basketry. <laughs> Yeah, well, part of my job now at the folk school is like helping out with the baskets and broom studio. Um, we do baskets, brooms, leather, cords, um, all that good stuff. So I, I did take a broom making class back in April, which was really fun. And it felt kind of like combining basket weaving and um, like weaving, weaving. It was, it was cool. And it was fun to make something in one day instead of like four months. Wow. Nan Solomon wants to know, are your tapestry four salvages? If not, how do you finish them? Are they four um, salvages? I've woven, no, not usually. I've done a couple four salvage ones. Um, once I try to do a shaped four salvage tapestry, mm -hmm. which is pretty fun. Um, but uh, usually what I do is I will um, take the fringe and just tie an overhand knot and then tuck it and tie and like um, sew it down on the back. Uh, I usually like to do a knot and I don't usually do like braids or anything. Um, another thing I got from Tommy, <laughs> just some <laughs> cute little overhead knots on the end. Uh, um, somebody wants to know what is a barn loom. Can you give so, people a quick description yeah. of what a barn loom is? 
Um, so barn looms are called that. I've heard for two reasons. Um, one is because they're like really big and they like size, like barn size. And the other one is that they're timber frame construction. So they're built using kind of like a similar um, woodworking technique to like old barns. Um, and uh, they are like really big. When I was up at Marshfield, the one that I was leaving on was like a six foot by six foot by six foot cube. Um, they're usually counterbalanced. A style so when you step on a treadle um, it moves some of the harnesses down and some of them up um, and it gives you a really nice big shed the loom is really wide so it's a lot easier to weave linen on sometimes because um, it has space to like move around and I really enjoyed it just because it felt more like it was built to a human scale um, and like you can get fully in it and like move around you don't have to like ha crouch mm. over when you're threading the loom or anything so um if you're interested in barn limbs, you should follow follow your passion because I they're amazing and I, I love them just as pieces of equipment. And you might be able to see one not too far off at John Campbell, right? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> if you can find space. Yeah, they're really big. If you've not, if y'all haven't seen a barn loom, they're huge. So yeah. Um Lisa Krause wants to know, on the really small pieces with all the detail, are you working with thread or yarn? Um, for my tapestries, I usually use uh, cotton stain twine, and those are probably set at like six to eight ends per inch, sometimes a little bit less than that, um, or a little more, I guess, like sometimes six to nine. But I don't like working with really fine stuff. It just, it annoys me. I would rather weave up shapes faster. Um, and the uh, wefts that I really like to use, I really like weaving with wool for the tapestries. I use um, Fevgarn Sprid um, that I get from North Fjord Fiber. It's really nice. Tommy Scanlon calls it a whole wheat yarn. And so it just is like kind of like firm and bouncy. Like I've tried using knitting yarn and it just squishes down so much that this has like really nice color. And um, yeah, and you can combine. I usually combine a bunch of like uh, lengths of thread together to make a bundle and it's nice for color blending. So I like weaving a little bit thicker. I don't really like weaving with thread. And where was the yarn from? Uh, Norsk Fjord Fiber. It's uh, I think it's Norwegian or some other Scandinavian brand of yarn. Where do you get it from? Um, that's Norsk Fjord Fiber is the name of the place where I order it from. Oh, Tommy, okay. Tommy just put it in the chat. Yay, Tommy. We can always rely on her. Um, oh, this is from Shanae Cahill. Can Allie give any recommendation for ham weavers that are new to North Carolina? She's in Hickory by way of Philly. Thanks. Um, let's see. There's the um, Folk Art Center in Asheville, if you've never been. Um, they have really great shows up there and a lot of the time they have hand weaving shows. Um, there are a lot of weavers around here. Um, if you can ever get out to any of the craft schools, like the folk school, um, Penland or Aramont or all not, they're like, you know, a drive from Hickory, but not super far. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of us around. Um, and so there's a lot of weaving around. <laughs> there's a uh, also a couple museums in Asheville, like Black Mountain College Museum. Mm -hmm. And I actually haven't been because they opened after I moved away, but the Asheville Museum of Art might have some weaving related stuff there. Um, yeah. She should Asha, probably go to John Campbell and take a tapestry class for a week, maybe. You yeah. know, you could, yeah, maybe. Um, she says that her partner worked with your brother. In oh, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Old home week. Here we go. Um, Michelle Gaines says that was it a Damascus finish that you were talking about when you finished your tapestries? Um, I don't remember what that is. So yeah, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I'm not, happy. I'm not sure. Maybe, but I, I just like take like a bunch of warp ends and tie an overhand knot and then or like sew it onto the back. So it's really simple. Um, oh, Michaela McIntosh also said Yadkin Valley with Leslie Fesserman. Oh yeah, yeah. yes. 
Leslie teaches here sometimes too. She's really lovely and they have um, classes out there. And, and uh, is it Sinead? Sinead? Um, also check into HTA because we list all the guilds in the area and there's a calendar on there. You can find out what's going on in the area. So we, we welcome you from Philadelphia. It's nice to have you down here. So if, if you weren't weaving, what do you think you'd be doing? If you hadn't fallen in love with weaving, would you have stayed with Phil, do you think? Um, no, because I realized when I was graduating college that if I wanted to keep making the kind of film I wanted to make, I would have to like go into academia. And that was absolutely not on the table <laughs> after going to undergrad at University of Chicago. So I was I knew that I was not <laughs> going to continue with that. Um, so I, don't, I have no idea, honestly, what I would be doing, but I did recently pick up blacksmithing. So, you know, maybe I would have found that had I not gotten super into weaving. So, um, yeah, that's what I'll go with now. I would be a blacksmith. <laughs> <laughs> now, everybody's mentioning uh, guilds and everything. So, Sinead, there's a bunch of things in the questions about where you should go and the Weavers Guild of North Carolina and... Weaver's Guild in South Carolina, in Georgia. We all want you. We all want you to join our group. So welcome. Um, if you could have any loom to weave on, I don't know if you've experienced enough looms yet, but if you could have any weave, any loom to weave on, what would you get? Did you get to play it all at would, Convergence? Um, I did not. I would just I would find the barn loom that like I that had a bench <laughs> built into question it. Question on my part, of course. <laughs> now, could you do That's tapestry on a barn and, loom? Um, I probably wouldn't. Um, just because it's counterbalanced and it was. I feel like I haven't tried it, but I feel like it might do weird things to the shed. Um, I really like weaving like tap a tapestry loom that I would weave on. I've never woven on like a really big wide one, but. I want to try that one time, but um, I really like Tommy upright has. looms for tap. Like Tommy, yeah. she has huge. She has a huge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't believe it, but we have to stop. Oh no! I know <laughs> this has been fun. Thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Sorry about our technical difficulties, but uh... yeah, it worked. It's so funny because what we we practiced last week, it was fine, but today it didn't work. Gremlins, gremlins, gremlins. Um, I do want to thank you for coming today, and also um, there's more information about Allie's work on um, Allie's website, um, and I encourage you all to go there and see more. It's allie dudley squarespace dot com. And you can see that great um, rug behind Allie that has eggs. Uh, we showed that earlier too. What a great rug, I love that. Um, so thank you so much for being on here, Allie. And then we need to thank your sponsor. Uh, again, that's the Weavers Guild of St. Louis in honoring Dorothy Haddock. Um, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, the Weavers Guild of St. Louis. Uh, next up, we will, uh, if you are interested in being a sponsor, if you would like to purchase for your business, your guild as an individual, please go to our website and you can learn more about being a sponsor. Uh, if you enjoy these programs and would like to see more, we encourage you to support HTA through your membership or through donating to the Fiber Trust. Uh, a lot of these special members, these special programmings happen because of donations to the Fiber Trust. If you've missed any episodes, you can join, you can watch them again on Facebook. Uh, you don't have to be a member. You can go on there and see all the past episodes of Facebook. We're also putting them on uh, YouTube. They're a little slow to get up, but we're getting those up there too. You can watch them there. Coming up, we got spinning and weaving week this fall. Can't believe we're working on it already, but it's not that far off. It's like, what, six, seven weeks? Um, spinning and weaving week. It'll be the first full week of October, 3rd through the 9th. And we have time for, we are looking for sponsorships. We are looking for people who want to advertise. Um, we are looking for people who want to do thread talks. If you're not familiar with that, it's like TED Talk, but it's thread talks. Um, we've got Marketplace Live. We're looking for our vendors to come back 
can show us their latest and greatest products. And of course, there's the fashion show. I want to see everybody at the fashion show. Um, we had a great time last year, some beautiful work, and it was so much fun. If you want more information about Spinning and Weaving Week, you can see it all on weavespindye.org. Um, thank you also for coming today. We do appreciate it. Um, next week, we will have Rebecca Winter as our guest. Hope you have a lovely week. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Happy tea.